or if something is broken, I can just switch it back in the users are back in my own version. Iteratively one, it allows me to do target rollouts, exactly for the reason that we just said, and it gives them uh, this operation flexibility where I separate deployment from release, and I can enable this to people that I want. On the comp side, again, complexity. As you've been, as you've been seeing with the patterns, we, we keep adding more and more stuff on top of things, so the complexity keeps increasing. So I will have more need to go back, go into your code base and say, okay, actually, I don't want this behind a feature flag, I, haven't, I want to take this back. So you will have to keep iterating and clean up, cleaning up your code. Testing overhead is something that we sometimes forget, but it's actually a, a big con of um, feature flags and, and, um, and dark launches. This, why is this? Because I actually want to test if the feature flag works, right? And I want to actually want to test if the dark launch works. So I need to ensure in my testing environment, in the production, if I give this only to the users with this header, will they be the ones to activate it or not? So we, we will have that extra step that I actually need to test if the feature flag is working or not. And another uh, extra challenge is coordination challenges. So, because now you will probably be running multiple versions of your service uh, at the same time, and you need to coordinate with other teams, so other teams will also have to be on board with this. Am I providing a new API and services will need access to other APIs? As customer support, you will know that now we have 10 versions of your services running, um, running at the same time. When a customer actually phones and says, I can't use your website, what version is the, is the, is the, is the, the user using? So those coordination challenges are also an extra hurdle that we need to overcome. Okay, now that we've addressed how, that some patterns to actually safely deploy our services, what about when unpredictable events happen um, when applications are live? So some of the patterns that we're going to see here provide us some mechanisms, mechanisms to cope with those failures. May they be partial failures, network issues, surging traffic, whatever they may be. So let's see them. Even the best designed systems can become slow or completely unresponsive, right? We've all experienced this. A database is struggling, an external dependency suddenly disappears. Timeouts will act as a deadline. We send a request somewhere, it doesn't respond within a, a certain time frame, we just say something wrong. But that's just half of what we can do. Like retries give an opportunity to our systems to actually retry stuff on our behalf, and we don't have to actually just send an error back to the user. So just using a graphical representation for this, service A sends a request to service B, and service B usually responds within five seconds, right? If five seconds is not good enough for us, we actually need, for, for example, for it to respond in, in three seconds, we can set a timeout, and doesn't matter, after three seconds you just say something is wrong, this is going to not good enough for me. Same representation for retries. We send a request, errors out, I don't want to actually try it out uh, manually, I can simply just do a retry and there are very, various strategies to do this more efficiently. Here's just an example of leveraging um, uh, a library to actually do this, so we're basically sending requests to apiexample.com for slash data, it allows us to specify how long is the, t is the timeout, how should I actually um, do the retries, and after a while I will eventually, if actually the service that I'm accessing is struggling, I will eventually get around. Pros and cons of using um, timeouts uh, time and retries. So, pros. It allows us to handle transient, transient, transient failure. So if I'm accessing a database and, for example, it's struggling for one second, it doesn't make sense that I keep just sending effort. I can simply retry and everything should be okay. It's very, very simple to implement. So there are thousands of libraries out there in multiple programming languages that you can, you can just use that will give you fancy, complex back of strategies that you can leverage to actually make things work. And of course, it gives, you, uh, gives us the opportunity to reduce user impact, right? So if I'm accessing a database and can just retry it out, the user won't see it. Yeah. On the con side, it has the potential to increase latency, right? So if I keep retrying uh, a request to a dependent service, a for a user, maybe it doesn't see an error, but it will actually see, oh, actually my request usually takes one second, now it's taking five. So it has the potential to increase latency. It, can also, it also has the risk of creating cascading failures. So if we're not careful with the retry strategy, we might run the risk of 
just keep hammering the service that is struggling, right? So if I just fail, maybe the service maybe the service um, recovers uh, on its own. But because now I'm just keep trying, okay, are you there yet? Are you there yet? Are you there yet? Maybe we can cause a cascading failure. It's also a little bit more resource intensive, right? So it will require it will require some more computation because now I'm actually setting deadlines, I'm waiting for stuff, I'm retrying stuff, so my systems will use more resources to actually have all these things running. And if we start getting fancier and fancier with back-off strategies, this, this, <coughs> sorry, these strategies can get very, very complex. Moving on to rate limiting. So, rate limiting can act as a traffic cop for our services. The idea for weight limiting is to control the, inc the inflow of requests that the service um, is receiving to prevent sudden, strikes, uh, sudden spikes or abuse uh, for our services. Think of it as a line outside a, a disco, right? So you have a bouncer there, not everyone can get in at the same time. So you have some control of who can get in and how many people can get in. And the, the concept here is very, very similar. <coughs> Rate limit is also crucial for fairness. So it allows us to actually control, like if we have two applications trying to access my, my service, that one cannot monopolize the, its usage. And it's also a protective measure against DDoS attacks. So if I have a botnet trying to access my service, I could actually have some line of defense just preventing services from being overwhelmed. <coughs> so, a very simple representation of how this could work. I have a user trying to access my API. I have some form of rate limiting in front of it. <coughs> Sorry. And if a user tries to abuse, tries to send more requests, it will somehow receive a response saying, you're using too much over my service. So if you, this is an example of a configuration that can be passed to Istio where we can specify how many requests each code path can actually use. <coughs> so here, for foo, I'm saying that foo can only receive one request at a time. And for bar, I'm saying that I can only receive 10 requests per minute. Sorry, guys. So, pros and cons of rate limiting. It allows us to prevent against DDoS attacks, like we just said. If I have someone just trying to flood my system, my system for malicious purposes, I have a way to just say no more, right? So you're prevented from doing so many requests. It allows us also allows us to be more proactive in terms of resource management and cost optimization. So if I don't want to have auto-scaling enabled to infinity, I can just say, okay, I can go up to a limit, and then at some point I'll just say to my users, I can't do this anymore, just wait a little bit. Mm -hmm. It also provides this fairness and prioritization. <coughs> <coughs> so by having users being more, uh, being kept at a certain request that they can do, I can actually tell them, okay, this is the amount of resources that you can use from my application. Again, similar to the DOS attacks, it can um, prevent abuse. Maybe it's not malicious, but maybe a customer is trying to, to do more requests than it should, so I'm just putting uh, a little bit of a stop to that. And of course, it improves user experience. On the con side, it's more complex than just uh, doing nothing, right? So I, I actually will need to put something in place. It could be at the local balancer level, could be at my call provider level, it could be at my service mesh level. It will add some complexity to my um, to my setup. It has the potential to fall, to have false positives. So depending on the values that we that we put, depending on the thresholds that we, that that we put, we might be get saying users you can't use my application, but probably they could. Mm -hmm. Another thing to note is regard, this regard is overhead. So now I have something in my system that is constantly checking if a user can or may or may not do a request. So this will add some overhead to his request. If I receive a request, the rate limit will say, can they, has the user reached this limit? So I actually need to, um, uh, to check that. And there are complex strategies to actually do this, uh, this kind of checking. <coughs> and of course, it can be circumvented, right? So there, there's so much. There's only so much that we can do with uh, with rate limiting. So there, if we have a motivated enough actor, 
there are ways to actually go around Riplink. Another example that didn't start as technology and we just got that from ships is the concept of a bulkhead. So, when a ship, a ship is built, it's usually built, ship built into modules, right? This is not only for storage, but it's also for safety reasons, right? So, if one of these com compartments floods, it gets shut down and the whole system, and the whole uh, ship doesn't go down, right? Doesn't sink. So, the idea of a bulkhead is the same thing, offers the same principle. It's this idea that we will build our systems in a somewhat of a compartmentalized way, so that if one part goes down, the whole system doesn't go down. And an example, or the simplest example that we can use for this is, if I have a service, I can split it into multiple replicas, right? So if, if I build my services right like this, if service goes down, everything is down. If I just compartmentalize this into multiple replicas, it's an easy way to, this goes down, the rest, um, the rest uh, is still working. Of course, this is very, very simple, but you can think about service instance for this, for example, to be a complete service. So, for example, I have an e-commerce website that has a search functionality. If my search functionality is struggling, I can somehow switch it down, but the rest is still working. The user can still browse the website. The user can still make a purchase. So, an example of compartmentalizing stuff, for example, in Kubernetes, is by using a network policy. So, by leveraging a network policy, I can, for example, I can, for example, isolate my replicas and say, for example, my, my app replicas can only talk to themselves. If they have a problem, nothing else gets affected. And they, can act, they also can't actually communicate with other parts of services and start uh, wreaking havoc. Pros and cons of bulkheads. So, isolation of failures. This is probably the, the biggest advantage of using bulkheads. Because now, I'm, I'm basically saying, if this part has a problem, nothing else has a problem. So I can isolate failures within its own boundaries. It allows our, also for us to do some resource management and prioritization. So, let's imagine that we get, get into a situation of, uh, I need to make a decision, I don't have any more hardware, I need to make a decision what works and what doesn't work. So, by using bulkheads, I can, for example, switch off search, but the rest keeps working. And, of course, that leads to graceful degradation. Yes, my search doesn't work, but as a user can still browse for whatever I'm selling and can actually make a purchase. On the con side, it's, it, it adds complexity again, right? So and now I need to build my system in a way that I can actually have the possibility, automatically or manually, to shut down stuff. If I do this automatically, I have some overhead. So I will need some form of monitoring that's saying, okay, search is struggling, I will switch it down, or I'll cap the amount of resources that it can use, and the rest is running. And it might make um, debugging a little bit more challenging. So, search is down. Why is search down? I have no idea. Was it something automatic that did it? Was some, someone manually? But the rest is working, so it might get confusing at times. And the last pattern that we're going to see are circuit breakers. So, again, another example of something that didn't come from our technology IT world. So, we all have circuit, circuits in our houses. If you have a power surge, a circuit will open so that all of our electronics don't go to waste. Everything doesn't work. And the concept here is very, very similar. We will put stuff in our system that will be checking if everything is okay, and if not, the circuit will open and will, for example, won't allow requests um, to flow to our systems, or won't allow for more messages from a Kafka cluster to be consumed. Very, very similar concept. So, looking at a simple representation of how this will work, we will have some sort of a circuit breaker command. If the circuit will open, is open, it will automatically reject the request saying, you can do this request. If everything, if the circuit is closed, it will just allow to execute. Of course, many of these patterns can start to build on top of each other, so that doesn't mean that, that I can use timeout and retries on, on this as well, but it, this combination will give us a lot of flexibility and a lot of resiliency out of the box. <coughs> so, the last example that we'll have here is leveraging Istio. So Istio has the concept of destination rule, doesn't matter um, for the moment right now, but allows us to, to specify traffic, something called a traffic policy. So I'm basically here we're specifying that for mydomain.com, I have my traffic policy, and for example, I'm saying that this, the, the, the request affected by this destination rule will, will only allow one request at a time and one request to be pending. So if I have one request being fulfilled in one waiting, all other requests will simply be rejected. 
because that's 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 my setup. It also allows you to specify if there's a problem and I'm starting to reject requests, how, how will ISU actually monitor if everything is back uh, again, so it will allow us to receive more requests. So pros and cons of circuit breakers. It allows us to prevent cascading failures. So for example, leveraging something like ISTU, I can actually monitor a downstream service and if it's it, might, it sees that that system is actually struggling, it will open the circuit and won't allow more requests, uh, more requests to go through. Also gives the same thing as graceful degradation. So by actually leveraging a, a, um, a circuit breaker, I can implement the bulk head pattern. Also allows self-healing. So for example, Istio or any other service mesh will give us the mechanisms to check if, for example, if a downstream service is struggling and also to get, get it back online. So it allows our systems to actually say, yes, the database is struggling, now the database is okay, you can actually continue to perform requests. Overall, it allows us to improve performance and a consequence of using a circuit breaker is because we want to do this automated, right? So our monitoring and observability will have to be enhanced because we will need to provide the tools that we'll use or if we build it from scratch to actually make these decisions for us. So I will need better observability and better monitoring because the system will need to make decisions on our behalf. Last but not least, the cons. It's complex, right? The rules will get complex, the pieces that I'll need to put in place will be very complex, so it will add a lot of the complexity to the, to the system. Same thing, it will allow for false positives, so depending on how I monitor and how I make decisions, the, we could have the risk of having false positives. Maintenance overhead as well. There will be a lot of moving pieces, a lot of configurations flowing in our system. So it will add some monitoring overhead. And it could have limited scope. So a circuit breaker could maybe, in some, or in some cases, will only be looking at a part of our system. So it might be making decisions based on localized information instead of the whole system as a whole. So, quick recap of what we just seen to here today. So we talked about cloud native and how important it is to build resilient cloud native applications. We saw a few deployment patterns, we explored a few of them ranging from basic recreate to stuff like rolling updates, dark launches and feature flags, and we saw some pros and cons for each of them. Same thing with resiliency patterns, we see, saw some ways that we can deal with stuff when services are actually running and they have the potential of failure and how to address them, and we actually saw pros and cons for each of these and some tools that we can leverage to not build things from scratch. So always be mindful of not trying to reinvent the wheel and exploring is there something out there that I can simply leverage and understand how it works and use it for my purposes. And this is all for my part. Thank you very much for attending my talk. Um, feel free to connect with me in social, send messages. I think we still have a minute or two for questions, if there are any questions. If not, I'll be around the whole day. Feel free to ping me and uh, we can chat. Thank you.